and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 150. Honestly, can't believe we hit 150 episodes, you guys. It's super exciting, especially as this show is just about to hit its 11th birthday. And if I had known on that Friday afternoon when I stopped at Best Buy on the way home from work to buy a cheap USB microphone and spent the weekend teaching myself how to podcast, that it would have led to all of the adventures and wonderful people that I've met over the past few years, I never would have believed you if you would have told me that. I've interviewed people I've always looked up to, like David Skinner and Allison Weir. We've done TutorCon, where I met so many amazing people and bonded with you all weekend. And of course, don't forget the TutorCon 2021 will be happening in early October 2021. And this year, we'll be doing a virtual event. So stay tuned for information on that. And I've dug deeper into this love I have for Tudor history way more than I ever thought possible. So this is just me saying thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of this awesome community and this awesome trip. Thank you for your support and being such an amazing group of people. I'm so happy to have met so many of you in person or online, and I hope I get to meet even more of you in the next 11 years and the next 150, 200 episodes. Who knows, right? And just one more thing, I think it's totally appropriate to announce this on the 11th birthday and 150 episodes. I have created a new group called the Tudor Learning Circle. It's at tutorlearningcircle.com. And it basically was born out of the fact that I want to get off of Facebook (laughs) because there are a number of reasons. And I think I said this last time too. So it's basically like a private social network that's just all about Tudor history. So tutorlearningcircle.com, you can go to sign up. It's free to join. And there's about 150, 200 people there already right now. And we're having some fun discussions. And it's awesome because it's all of the joy of a tutor group online without any of the drama that goes along with social media. So it's fantastic. And also within that, while you're there, you'll see there's a couple of um, circles they're called. So different groups. So there's the Tutor Learning Circle Premium, which is a membership group that I'm setting up that you can join. It's $4.99 a month. And with that, you get extra podcasts, you get audio courses. The one I'm working on right now for August is about the age of exploration. And you get lots of free books and content that I create and discounts at my shop, as well as other discounts with other tutor creators that I'm setting up as well. And chats regular chats, about three a month or so we're going to start doing. So that's the premium tutor learning circle. Of course, you can just join the tutor learning circle for free. That's not a problem at all. But you can step up and go premium for $4.99 a month. And then that's also where we're going to do virtual tutor con. So there's another circle that you can join. It's $29.99. And that's where tutor con from October 2nd through 4th, the virtual tutor con is going to be held in that group. So you can sign up for that circle as well if you like. Or you can just go to tutorlearningcircle.com and join the free network too. However you want to do it, I'm going to be thrilled to see you over there in whatever capacity. So tutorlearningcircle.com. Now, this episode is going back to the tour of the tutor home that I started in the kitchen a few episodes ago. This week, we're going to look at the tutor living room and the way the living room was changing in the 16th century. So the first thing to think about with the living room is, what does it actually do? What do we do in the living room? Sometimes we entertain our friends. We lounge around in our PJs watching movies. Sometimes we sit around the coffee table and play a board game. It's basically a space for being social and spending most of our time where we're not busy doing something else. The bedroom is the place where we sleep. The kitchen is the place to cook and possibly eat. And the bathroom is the place to take a bath and do all of that kind of stuff. But what is the living room? It's this place where we spend large parts of our day when we don't have a specific task that happens in one of those other places. It's sort of a catch-all room. Since we see so much change during the 16th century, it's worth going back to the end of the 15th century and talk about how things were at the very beginning of the Tudor period. Most homes had halls. This was the main part of the home was the hall. And that's where the social aspect of the home would happen. 
Of course, halls date way back to the Danish period. When we think about halls, we often think about feasts after a battle and scenes like from the Last Kingdom. Or maybe that's just me. Interestingly, the Angles, the Saxons, and other invaders after the Romans could have actually used the Roman structures. They were still standing, but they chose not to. They didn't even use the Roman cities. I think this is like a fun fact. It's not related to Tudor history, but it kind of is because everything's related. But London itself was empty for 300 years while the Anglo-Saxon Lundenvik grew up outside the walls around where Aldwych is now. So it wasn't until the later Danish invasions and Alfred the Great that people actually went back behind the Roman walls. But we can thank them for not using the Roman villas because thanks to them, we have halls. And halls have lasted through even to today. How many of us say things like, oh, my coat is in the hall closet. Of course, hall means something different to us in today's usage. But it all starts from that kind of catch-all room that people had to be social. Halls were the foundation of medieval society. And of course, this is how it would have been right on the eve of the Tudor dynasty. Servants lived with their employers. Everyone ate, slept, and lived communally. People lived in social units much more than we do, at least in America and much of Europe today. Even within a family that had its own small cottage, you would have relatives and the extended family all living together. And in the hall, you would have an open fireplace. And then you would have various tables around, high tables for the owner of the home and servants' tables, all of that. The table, of course, is a board laid across trestles. And that's where the term room and board comes from. And also that's where the term chairman of the board comes from, because the most important chair would go to the owner, and he was, in fact, the chairman of the board. Also, cupboards come from literally cup board, where people would put their cups on a board. The fire was the central feature, but since there weren't chimneys until the Tudor period, which we talked about in the kitchen episode, the room would have been very, very smoky. Also, it would have had very high ceilings to let the smoke gather up at the top to try and make it less smoky. But by the 16th century, people were getting chimneys, which is actually what made the living room possible, because the chimneys split up the rooms. So on one side, you could have a kitchen and use the fire on that side for cooking. And then on the other side, you could have a sitting room to just sit in front of the fire. So the chimneys split up the rooms. But something else that the chimney made possible was to build upstairs to build on top of each other. Because when you just had a hall, you had this open space at the top, and you probably had a hole in the ceiling to let some of the smoke out. um, And that's how it would be. You'd have these great beams that went across. But with a chimney carrying the smoke out, you could actually lay floorboards across those beams. And that made it possible to have a second story. And then you have rooms upstairs. But we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. For now, let's just continue on with the living room. The floors were likely just dirt with rushes on them. Those rushes would have been home to small rodents, as well as all kinds of bodily secretions, urine, vomit, and an incredibly unhygienic way of living conducive to spreading plague and all kinds of other sicknesses. In 1524, Erasmus wrote after touring England, he said, The floors are, in general, laid with white clay and covered with rushes, occasionally renewed, but so imperfectly that the bottom layer is left undisturbed, sometimes for 20 years, harboring expectoration, vomiting, the leakage of dogs and men, ale droppings, scraps of fish, and other abominations not fit to be mentioned. Whenever the weather changes, a vapor is exhaled, which I consider to be very detrimental to health. I may add that England is not only everywhere surrounded by sea, but is in many places swampy and marshy, intersected by salt rivers, to say nothing of salt provisions in which the common people take so much delight. I'm confident the island would be much more salubrious if the use of rushes were abandoned and if the rooms were built in such a way as to be exposed to the sky on two or three sides and the windows so built as to be opened or closed and so completely closed as not to admit the foul air. For it is beneficial to the health to admit the air, it is equally beneficial at times to exclude it. That sounds really, really disgusting and really gross. Can you imagine walking around on 20 years worth of 
all of that stuff. Just no. So once you divided up the space and you built the second stories and had the chimney dividing, it meant the space got darker because there was less area, obviously, for the light to go around. So you would have to think about lighting more. To light a room on a tight budget, you would use a rush light. Again, one of those rushes just dragged through animal fat. You'd put it on a holder and you would burn it. And these would last about 20 minutes. You could also use tallow candles by dipping wicks into pots of animal fat repeatedly. Before you lit the candles, you would seal everything off in the house to keep any drafts from coming in. The drafts, of course, would make the candles burn faster. The tallow candle would last longer, but of course it cost more. And since it was so expensive to light your home after dark, people would actually have rotating light sharing parties of sorts, where all the candles would go into one home for a while so you could pool the resources. So you would go around from day to day to day, alternating where you would spend your lighting time, I suppose. That way you could get in some extra sewing or some extra household chores. The fire was also necessary for heat and for light. Of course, as chimneys became more popular, they became a status symbol. It was a chance for the wealthiest people to show off just how wealthy they were. The chimneys projected wealth because it meant that there were a lot of fireplaces with a lot of wood being burned and lots of forests able to provide all of that wood. Hampton Court, for example, had 241 chimneys. Can you imagine how stunning that would have been for people who couldn't afford firewood, for example? and who had to go out every day and pick up twigs and spend hours trying to find firewood. We talked about that in the kitchen episode as well, how people would have to go out and find the firewood for the day. So can you imagine if they would have seen Hampton Court with 241 chimneys, how much wood that would have meant? It's important to note that not everybody actually aspired to chimneys. Some people missed the open hearths and believed that they were healthier with the air moving around more. In 1577, a man called William Harrison said that in the days of open fires, our heads never did ache. And chimneys actually meant that the room wasn't nearly as warm as before. Fireplaces were so inefficient, they actually kept being enlarged. And some fireplaces actually had benches inside the fireplace itself so that people could sit in the fire to get warm. Which kind of seems like just sitting in front of an open hearth, but. I guess the smoke would go out easier. The wealthiest homes also had glass windows. Glass had been around since the medieval times in churches, but in the 16th century, it made it out of the church into the wealthy homes. But they were still status symbols, even through the 16th century. For example, in 1590 in Doncaster, an alderman's will left his house to his wife, but his windows to his son, which would have made the wife quite chilly. And the sun quite wet when it rained if he just had windows. So I'm not sure what exactly they did to work that out, but that was in a will. House going to one place, windows to another. Some owners of large homes would actually have their windows taken out and stored when they went away. Then take my favorite person, Bess of Hardwick, who built her home, Hardwick Hall, known as More Glass Than Wall. The one fun fact is that the builders were still learning how to work with glass as they were going. This is a new kind of technology for them. They didn't really know how to work with glass as they were building. And initially, the architect of Hardwick Hall, Robert Smithson, supposedly, didn't know how to fit all of the windows in to the plans. Some of the windows are shared by rooms on different floors. Some are blanks in front of chimneys. It's really quite humorous that he didn't really know how to fit all of these windows in. So one thing we see at Hardwick Hall was that fact that the chimney allowed for the easy construction of upper floors. Whereas when there was this one big central hearth and no chimney, like I said, you would have the ceilings as high as possible, and maybe you would even have some windows up there for the smoke to get out. But with a chimney, you seal off those spaces and you put rooms upstairs, and that allowed for a new room called a great chamber, where the homeowner and their family discovered the joy of personal space away from servants. The great chamber allowed the Lord and the family to do all of the things that they would have done in the hall before, but in the privacy of just their family. They would then use the great hall for banquets and other events. 
So suddenly people had privacy, had personal space, and that revolutionized the way people interacted, not just with their servants, but even with their equals. With this discovery of personal space, eventually people wanted to have rooms where they could escape not just their servants, but also their family. In the 14th and 15th century, we would see new names of new rooms come into use to describe these new arrangements. We'd see room names like the study, the closet, the oratory, library, salon, suite, and more. By the end of the 16th century, these rooms were filtering down into the middle classes. And we go from an entire household living in a great hall to people splitting off into all of these other rooms, which might be how you live today. You know, I think about it and there are times where I'm in my office and my daughter is in her bedroom and my husband is in the living room and we're in this house, but we're not together, right? With a great hall, we all would have just been together. At Hardwick Hall, there was still an entry hall, but the real heart of the room was this great chamber a couple stories up. That room was reserved for the visitors, unlike the medieval hall where the servants and the homeowners mixed, like I said. Then there was another new room at Hardwick Hall called the Long Gallery. And then beyond that, there was the withdrawing room, which later in the 17th and 18th century became known just as the drawing room. And again, all of this led to a big change in the relationship between the Lord and the servant. The servant was no longer a part of the family as they had been when everyone was just in the hall together. So you could say that this kind of directly led to Downton Abbey and the upstairs downstairs sort of thing was this change. You know, somebody should write a thesis about that. Chimneys leading to Downton Abbey. I would love to read that thesis. Somebody do that. (laughs) So in the 16th century, a drawing or living room was something really reserved for the aristocracy. And the poor people didn't have any time to just sit because they were always working. And they probably lived in the home of their employer. But in this rising middle class, this class that grew up during the 16th century, more and more people were interested in creating their own versions of living rooms. And we would see that become even greater in the 17th century. So let's talk about furniture for a minute. Because large estates had so many servants living on them, people were much more mobile than they are today. Just like we talk about the court moving from house to house to house where there's food and firewood, so would other lords. So furniture was made to be mobile as well. And most furniture didn't take on this sense of permanence and heirloom status that we have today until the end of the 16th century. And that would be in a place like Hardwick Hall, you see furniture that's more made to last, that's more made to stay in the home year round. One fun fact is that chests often have these curved tops because it would throw off the rain or the snow when traveling. So furniture was really designed to be moved around and to be mobile. One fun thing that started in the 16th century was the chest of drawers. It took people a while to figure out that trunks, you could turn them and then put drawers in them, and they became trunks of drawers or chests of drawers. So that was something that came about in the 16th century. And that, again, was a sign of this more permanent level of society that was emerging. When we think about these living spaces of these homes, we see that things weren't really comfortable in the way that they are now. For most people, remember, life was hard, and much of their time was spent just figuring out how to survive, how to get enough firewood, how to get enough food, how to get enough clothing to make it through. Researchers have gone back and found that about one in four harvests were bad. So you really didn't get much time to build up any kind of storage, any kind of reserve supplies. And so about one year and four, you were going hungry and the hunger was immediate. Plus, there was still plague happening and all kinds of other diseases. So comfort was pretty low on the sort of order, the hierarchy of needs. And even in places like Hardwick Hall, the floor was still just simple rush mats. And in that long gallery that I mentioned, it was 166 feet long. There were only three tables and a few straight back chairs. So there really wasn't this sense of like, come in and get comfortable and make yourself at home. That's something that didn't really exist yet for most people at that point. Bill Bryson has said that you could sum up the history of private life in a sentence just by saying that it was this slow movement towards comfort. 
In the Tudor period, the word comfort meant to actually give someone help who was sick or who was hurt. You would give them comfort. The word only took on its modern meaning as a place where you want to get cozy in your PJs with a book and a cup of tea in the 18th century. It was Horace Walpole who first wrote of it in that way when he said that he was as comfortable as possible in a letter. So we start to see just the very tiniest beginnings of that in the 16th century with places like Hardwick Hall that do have furniture that's made to last, that has windows, has the second story. Hardwick Hall is almost like this microcosm, though on a grand scale, of what living rooms were becoming, of what homes were becoming in the 16th century. Places that afforded privacy, sort of like the homes that we now have today that are split up into multiple rooms where we have privacy, where we have personal space and we can get away and have some time to ourselves and start to really be comfortable and start to feel permanent and start to really feel like it's a place that we want to go and get cozy in, right? So that's it for this week. Show notes are at englandcast.com slash living room. I, of course, want to shout out again the Bill Bryson book, At Home, A History of Private Life, which has inspired me to do this. There are some other resources, though, too. So let me know what you thought about this episode. You can get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016-TESCO. That's 801-683-9756. Or also pop into the Tutor Learning Circle, tutorlearningcircle.com, and I will see you in there. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back in another couple of weeks. Bye-bye. Blow northern wind, a sandful baby sweating. Blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hote bord in Bauerbrick, at Sully Samli. So once you divided up the rooms like I talked about, it actually meant that the space got darker because there was less space for the So once you divided up the rooms, like I said, with the chimney and the second stories at Alex, oh my God, blah.